Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit Podcast. This is our second of five episodes discussing Shakespeare's very popular tragedy, the Scottish play, The Tragedy of Macbeth. Last week, uh, we introduced, albeit briefly, um, Shakespeare, as if he needs any introduction, by by mentioning his vast popularity and influence on the English language. Um, we also introduced the context of the play, pointing out that it was likely written and performed for James I, the first king of Great Britain, although this really can't be known for sure. You know, we discussed the gunpowder plot and how the scandal around uh, priest Henry Garnett surfaces in this play through the use of the word and the concept of equivocation. We used that word a lot last time. We talked about the setting of the play, uh, remembering that setting involves both time and place. The place is Scotland. The time is somewhere between 1040 and 1057, uh, which, of course, would be the years in which the real historical Macbeth actually ruled as king in Scotland. Uh, we'll talk about this more in another episode, but you can't really think of this play as historical. Um, it's very intentional, not historically accurate in uh, many important and interesting ways. And, you know, finally, uh, we talked through the first four scenes of the play. And, Christy, the irony is not lost on me that we will be talking about this play for almost twice the amount of time it actually takes to perform it. <laughs> That's so true. Uh, but I'll, I'll say it again, as difficult as it is to work through a Shakespeare play, it's worth it. There's a lot going on. It engages our mind, our curiosity, our sense of humor, our passion. You know, one point of interest that I did want to bring up before we get into the play of self, and you alluded to it, when you talked about it being called the Scottish play, and that would be the curse of the Scottish play. Gary, tell us what all that's about, because that's kind of fun. Well, it's myth, it's legend, uh, but even that ironically plays into one of the big ideas of this play, because it plays around with the idea of how much um, we as modern people believe and fear the mystical, the spiritual <laughs> realm. You know, so legend has it that in 1606, the play Macbeth was cursed by a coven of witches who were angry that Shakespeare was using real incantations in the play. And because of this, all sorts of disasters are associated with the play. I mean, for example, in the original production, it is believed that the actor playing Lady Macbeth died and Shakespeare himself may have had to take the part. But that's just the beginning. Um, in a production in 1672 in Amsterdam, someone switched out the daggers in the play and the actor playing Duncan was literally killed. In 1849, a deadly riot broke out in Manhattan at the Astor Opera House where the play was uh, being performed and it resulted in 31 deaths. In 1937, Laurence Olivier was hit from a heavy weight that fell in the theater and it almost killed him. Um, in 1942 in London, three actors in the play died on opening night and the set designer committed suicide. I mean, <laughs> we're going to go on. In 1947, it's documented that an actor by the name of Harold Norman playing Macbeth actually died on stage. Uh, I could go on all the way to the present. Uh, you know, there are stories of food poisoning to the entire cast. An actress walking right off the stage and falling into the orchestra pit. Uh, the director breaking out with shingles. Actors breaking appendages. Theaters going bankrupt. I mean, it's freaked out so many actors that at this point that most actors will not even utter the name of the play when they're <laughs> inside the theater. The idea being that it is uttering the name Macbeth. That's how you invoke the curse. And, uh, but if you do accidentally mention the play Macbeth in the theater and you would like to avoid any of these horrible calamities, there is an anecdote that will remove the curse. Well, thank goodness for that. Please tell. Well, you must exit the theater, spin around three times, spit, curse, and then <laughs> knock on the theater door to be allowed back in. Oh. Goodness, well, thank goodness there's a cure. You know, the good news is I don't think anyone has ever been cursed that I know of by mentioning the name of the play in a podcast. Oh, so, my. So hopefully we're safe. We may be the first. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm afraid now, but that is good to know. Well, today we finish Act 1, and then we'll try to sprint as fast as we can through the murder of Duncan in Act 2. And yes, 
I know, that was a spoiler. Duncan is murdered. But that's okay. You know, spoilers don't really spoil the fun for Shakespeare. I mean, most of the time, they're actually helpful. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If you haven't paid attention in the last 500 years, (laughs) then I don't feel guilty about the spoiler. Uh, Anyway, so by way of review, um, Act 1, Scene 1 starts with thunder and lightning and witches Fair is foul and foul is fair. And scene two, we meet Duncan and his son Malcolm, and we hear of the bravery of Macbeth. And he's waging and winning wars against rebelling thanes. Um, the first being MacDonald, whom he cuts open from his belly to his jaw and fixes his head upon the castle wall. And, and the second, the thane of Cawdor, who he attacks so recklessly and with such little regard for his own self that it draws commendations from other commanders. And in scene three, we're back to witches, but this time uh, we finally meet brave Macbeth. And instead of just hearing about him, uh, we also meet his good friend and his comrade, Banquo. These two men have been waging war together and on their way back are engaged by the witches and are given very cryptic prophecies. And, you know, uh, Macbeth is told that he will be the new Thane of Cawdor, which is a prestigious title, and but that he will also be king. And Banquo, after hearing this, asks about his future, and he's told his children will be kings. And this, you know, maybe could be seen as treasonous. I mean, there's already a king, but the witches never suggest to the men that they're supposed to murder the existing king. I mean, there could be any number of events that would change things. Banquo, however, is suspicious that the witches may be up to something. And at the end of the scene, he says a couple of interesting things. Now, we didn't highlight these in the last episode, but I wanted to go back to them because they're worth mentioning. First, he cautions Macbeth about trusting witches. He says this, "'Tis strange, and oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths with us, with honest trifles, to betray the deepest confident consequences." Okay, you're going to have to translate that. What does that mean? Well, it means oftentimes the instruments of evil, I mean, darkness in this play represents evil, but oftentimes the instruments of evil will tell us just a little bit of truth, not the whole truth, but a little bit in order to mislead us, to betray us into doing something awful. And right after he makes this point to Macbeth, we see that there's this word aside next to Macbeth's lines. And we remember that when we see that, that means we're going to hear Macbeth talking, but he's not really talking. It's what he's thinking, and the other characters don't hear him. These are his private thoughts. According to Banquo's next line, Macbeth has actually become lost in his thoughts. Banquo looks at his friend's face and sees what he calls new horrors coming upon him, like new clothes, but they don't fit well. You know, that's an example of the kind of metaphorical language Shakespeare uses, and we can understand exactly what he means. In Macbeth's mind, he's trying on treason the way one might try on new clothes. But in Macbeth's case, treason doesn't fit very well. It's a bit of foreshadowing. Uh, We'll see that it really doesn't. So let's read this aside. I know it's revisiting Act 3, I mean Act 3, Scene 3 of Act 1, but like I said in this In the last episode, the play is really only a tragedy if we can identify in some way with Macbeth. I mean, we have to believe in his greatness and his potential for greatness. Otherwise, it's just not tragic. You know, he says this, I am Thane of Cawdor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thoughts, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise and nothing is but what is not. All right, let's decode that a little bit. <laughs> All right. What is he saying? Well, uh, last episode you pointed out that the only way for a new person to be king is for the current king to die. Well, that's what he's thinking about. He finds himself yielding to an image so horrible, so fantastical, that it unfixes his hair. That's how he says it. And it makes his heart beat against his ribs. So he's dwelling on what he calls horrible imaginings. And, of course, you can imagine what that might be. Uh, It could be anything. He's imagining murder. He says it's fantastical now. That's fantasy. 
But, you know, the thought is there. Well, and there you go. Uh, You know, the connection between the imagination and reality. And, you know, of course, uh, psychology has a lot to say about this. Um, But it's obvious to most of us that uh, decisions don't happen outside of our imagination. I mean, there's a place in our brain where we imagine and project the future. We envision it, then we determine whether that event is good or bad. And, you know, and and this, of course, uh, that's what we're seeing Shakespeare illustrate literally 500 years before uh, psychologists or scientists even heard of uh, DMN or the default mode network. Well, and Macbeth struggles to make the decision. True. And we see that Macbeth is not naturally an evil person, or these images wouldn't horrify him. I mean, if, uh, you know, if a sociopath uh, dreams of murdering a person, it's actually going to bring some degree of pleasure. Um, It's actually terrifying, Macbeth. And, you know, murder, uh, like the clothes Shakespeare was talking about, it just doesn't fit him properly. And, you know, when we shifted um, to scene four of Act One, Duncan and Malcolm meet up with Macbeth and Banquo. And, you know, Duncan, just for context, is the current king, uh, the one Macbeth has been fighting to defend and the one he's imagining uh, what it would be like to kill. And, you know, Duncan tells Macbeth he's heading to Macbeth's house, but also that his son is his appointed successor to the throne. You know, and I do want to point out that uh, this is not ungenerous on Duncan's part or even ungrateful. Duncan has rewarded Macbeth with a very high-level position, um, the title of the Thane of Cawdor. He also promises him that he, and, you know, and I want to quote Duncan here, plans to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. You know, in other words, uh, I do hope to do even more great things for you. And uh, Shakespeare's Duncan is a generous leader. He's a grateful leader. Uh, he's even got this intention of elevating his cousin Macbeth to a high rank, not to replace him as king, but, you know, to a high position. And this is absolutely not unreasonable or even unhistorical. And um, scholars have pointed out that in Scotland, the uh, the father to son legacy was not guaranteed in Scotland. And many times being the king was contested. Uh, And this is true, in fact. Uh, I mean, that's how the play opens. Uh, These other things are making a play for the position of king. But I also want to point out that it isn't unusual either uh, for a king to anoint his son. And Shakespeare, who, of course, is writing for the court of James, makes clear that Duncan, also a relative of James, absolutely possesses the legitimate claim to the throne in spite of Macbeth and Duncan being cousins. does get a little confusing. There's a lot going on. (laughs) You know, we've got Shakespeare and then we've got British history. It just complicates it all. (laughs) But bottom line, Duncan is supposed to be king and his son is too. Right. And Duncan was building a family alliance, but he wants his son to succeed him, obviously, with Macbeth's support and help. And perhaps um, had Macbeth not met the witches, maybe he would have wouldn't have been upset by the idea that Malcolm was the heir apparent, and, and perhaps it should have been a, impossible as expected. And you know, and so uh, we are left with the, the question: as many of us, uh, did the witches set him up? Did they plant this idea in his head to be cruel to him the same way they were cruel to the sailor in Scene Three? And another question: Why does he even have to listen to these witches? Everyone listens to witches. Uh, I don't think so. (laughs) You know, readers and play watchers have been arguing about that chicken and head. I mean, those which comes first, you know, the chicken or the egg question since the play was first performed. I mean, we talked about it in class and my students don't agree on the answer. You know, to what degree are we influenced by evil suggestions? I mean, that's a moral question. It's a question... In the Bible, and I brought up Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden because that's as old as it can get, uh, at least in Western culture. I mean, would Adam and Eve have eaten the forbidden fruit had it not been suggested by somebody outside of them? Or was the desire or the ambition already within them? And they would have eaten that fruit sooner or later because it was in their nature. Ambition is the word in the text. You know, but maybe that's not... You know, I don't know if that's really the right word because ambition doesn't necessarily connote evil. We're talking about something that's perhaps more consuming, um, a, a desire that's strong enough that it would force you to disregard the consequences, the morality of any certain thing. You know, Tolkien kind of expressed 
how he looked at it through the character of Gollum in The Hobbit and his lust for the ring. And maybe we should just call it lust, although that word can sometimes, you know, make us think of sexual connotations. But in this case, I think we're talking something much broader than that. You know, whatever the word we want to choose, lust, ambition, it's this insatiable drive for whatever it is, money, power, sex, forbidden fruit, whatever. Uh, Does that desire come from within or does it come from without? This play asks this question, but this is no morality play, and I'm not sure Shakespeare actually answers it. And when we arrive in Act 1, Scene 5, we add another layer of complexity, and this would be Lady Macbeth. She's a fascinating character. I mean, over the years, she's been very maligned. You mentioned that she even has her own entry in the Oxford Dictionary, but it's not a <laughs> good one. She's infamous. No, if, more than you know, Lady Macbeth is defined as a remorseless and melodramatic woman, especially one leading a weak man. I wouldn't want to be called that. I would argue uh, that maybe that definition is arguable, but I won't make that judgment. Let's introduce the leading lady herself. Well, Lady Macbeth is entering the play in scene five. And, you know, there are a couple of interesting things that strike me, uh, both from a historical but also from a psychological perspective. Uh, First of all, she's reading a letter in Shakespeare Day. Shakespeare's Day, uh, this would have been unusual. uh, But at the time of the setting of the play, this would have been extraordinary. You know, the first characterization of Lady Macbeth is that she is an extraordinary woman. And at the time Shakespeare is writing, Only about 30% of men could read. Uh, Women, as you might imagine, would have been an even smaller number in around 10%. So in Macbeth's day, that number would have been even lower. So we're immediately aware that Lady Macbeth is special. She's highly educated. She's a trusted advisor to her husband. Uh, In the play, he has barely had time to finish the battle, and he's already written and sent a letter to his wife about what happened. Um, And we see that he calls her his partner. He calls her, in fact, dearest partner of greatness. I mean, that's a that's really a wonderful and and loving term of endearment. Oh, dearest partner of greatness. I don't recall ever having heard that before. (laughs) I think you should practice that more. Oh, my. It's implied. (laughs) Well, this whole uh, this whole letter scene makes no sense in terms of just communicating information. I mean, he was going to be home almost as fast as the letter could get there. And of course, uh, the letter lets us know what Macbeth is thinking and then what Lady Macbeth thinks of his ideas. So I can see that there's a really dramatic reason for introducing the idea of murder, you know, through this convention of a letter. But uh, I want to suggest Shakespeare is also highlighting just how connected these two are as a couple. Uh, But before I make my comments as to why that matters, um, you know, I also want to share a couple of fun facts about the real historical Lady Macbeth, who, by the way, uh, is not this one. Um, (laughs) In real life, Lady Macbeth had a first name. Obviously, her name was Grooch. Grooch. Well, that's cacophonous. If uh uh, that's a mild way to put it. No disrespect to any grooches out there listening. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I thought so, too. And, and maybe that's why he doesn't use it. Uh, a name like that might be distracting. But, <laughs> you know, another fun fact. Um, in real life, the real Lady Macbeth was the granddaughter of Kenneth IV, a different Scottish king. Now, I know this is a bit nerdy, but kind of, you know, right. hang, hang. Here we go. Down into the history. Hang with me here a little bit. Uh, Lady Macbeth's grandfather was killed in a fight with Duncan's grandfather when Duncan's grandfather took the throne. So in real life, Lady Macbeth would likely have held a grudge and there's been some bad family blood about the death of her grandfather. And, you know, it would be understandable for that reason uh, that, that she would have encouraged her husband to challenge Duncan for the throne. And um, Shakespeare, however, does not really include that in his characterization of uh, Lady Macbeth. You know, in real life, Lady Macbeth might have encouraged her husband to do what the other rebelling things did, which, you know, is not murder him in their home. You know, there's no honor in that. Uh, and and how could you get a country to accept your legitimacy if you do something as awful as backstabbing, you know, which is another Shakespearean <laughs> metaphor that we will use. 
You know, raising an army of your own, rebelling and challenging the current king was happening all the time. In fact, in the very history book that Shakespeare uh, used to get the story, Holinshed said, we'll talk about that and we'll talk about that in another episode. But in the book that depicts the actual history of Scotland, the word murder is not used when things challenged and killed kings. Holinshed uses the word slew, which kind of indicates a moral difference. Um, but as we said before, this play is not historically accurate. In the play, the act of murder is very much an immoral act, both in the minds of the victims, for sure, but also in the minds of the perpetrators. I mean, that's the point of the play. Um, I just thought knowing that history was an interesting fun fact and just a bit of a digression. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's interesting. I don't think many people even think about Lady Macbeth having a first name, and, and they certainly don't know it. And I had no idea of the real connection between the families. Anyway, back to the theatrical performance, the fake Macbeths, if you want to call them that. In Act 1, Scene 5, we'll meet Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth. And like you said, the first words that come out of her mouth are not her words. They're her husband's words. She's reading a letter. He tells her about the new title. He tells her about the witches. But he also tells her that the witches have called him the future king. However, he includes her in the promise. He says, I want to let you know what greatness is promised thee, which is not exactly what they said, but it's how he sees it. In other words, this prophecy wasn't just for me. It's for you too. Lady Macbeth reads the letter, but then we get to hear her thoughts uh, in a couple of different soliloquies. Uh, I think these are very important to read carefully, especially because, you know, you don't, I don't think it's right. I mean, you probably disagree, but I don't see Lady Macbeth as a psychopathic killer <laughs> who just eggs her sweet, darling, kind husband into murdering someone he didn't want to murder. I just don't see it like that. Well, of course you don't. So, you know, defend Lady Macbeth for us, if you will. <laughs> well, first we see the famous line that's been used to characterize Macbeth as a softy, uh, but, you know, that he's a kind man. Uh, I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Uh, but we just saw him slot murder violently a whole bunch of men. You know, she says, uh, thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, thou wouldst thou wholly, wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou have great glamis, that which cries, thou must, thus thou, I'm stumbling over it myself, thus thou must do if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do than wish it should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. <laughs> okay. Well, that doesn't seem to make her look great, you know. Um, she fears her husband's nature is too full of the milk of human kindness. And, you know, it implies that she's either more unkind than him or more uh, inhuman, depending on how you read that word kindness. But likely it's both. It's a pun. But then she goes on to say that she needs to pour her spirit into his ear so he'd have the nerve to do what he needs to do. That kind of reminds me of Hamlet's Uncle Claudius pouring <laughs> poison in Hamlet's father's ear. True, and it's also what the serpent did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He used words. You know, words into the ear can poison a person's understanding of the world. It's an interesting way to think of that. There's no doubt, you know, Lady Macbeth thinks she's stronger internally than her husband. But, you know, she's a woman. Isn't that true for all women? <laughs> well, first of all, do you want to apply having the nerve to murder somebody, a skill that women should have? I'm kidding. Oh, okay. I, I thought, I know you want to start some gender wars right here. Well, I'm sort of kidding. I may believe that. No, I'm, I'm not one way or the other. What I'm saying is this text introduces this couple, and they're very closely bonded. And we don't see that in Shakespeare. In fact, they may be the only couple, I'd say, functional marriage that I can think of in, in all of Shakespeare. They're on the same page in life. 
They know each other. They support each other. He wrote her ahead of time because he wanted her to know before he got home what he was thinking. Macbeth wants her support. He wants her strength. Uh, you know, he sees her as strong and he wants that on his side. She understands what her husband wants from her. Uh, she understands what her husband uh, wants for himself. And she fights for him. And this is an era where people fight. I mean, what I find more interesting, though, is the second soliloquy. After the little speech about Macbeth being full of human kindness, a messenger comes in and tells Lady Macbeth that the king is coming that night. Macbeth knew that already. Lady Macbeth, perhaps Macbeth himself, both understand, all right, this is what this is about. This is the chance. And and maybe he understood that. Maybe there's that implied connection between the two. Because listen to how she talks. She says this, The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. I mean, it's already there in the first line. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here. Fill me from the crown to the top toe, full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunction visiting of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect of it. Come to my woman's breast, take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you want on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes." nor heaven peek through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. I mean, what do you hear? Listen to that language. <laughs> well, um, she's invoking agents of hell to fill her with the ability to murder. <laughs> right. It's like she feels like that's what her husband's asking her to do. Exactly. And she's praying to evil spirits to make her evil. I find that so interesting. Why would you do that? I mean, if you're a psychopath... Would you, Gary, uh, just like you brought up Macbeth, Lady Macbeth doesn't seem naturally inclined to murder. If she's going to pull this off, she feels like she needs the help of hell. Is that something that a psychopath would pray for? <laughs> Do they need to pray to commit evil? Uh, no, they don't. They're completely comfortable with doing it. They're pretty much operating without uh, a sense of empathy um, or a sense of guilt. So, yeah, Lady Macbeth is not really acting like a psychopath at this point. She's acting like a very ambitious person, though. Well, and it's a problem. I mean, she says this, take the milk from my breast. That's an interesting phrase for a couple of reasons. First of all, this nurturing thing that women have, replace it with gall, which is a bitter drink. That's a biblical allusion. In the crucifixion scene of Jesus, the Roman officer offers Jesus some wine mixed with gall that he didn't drink because he didn't want to lose his ability to feel. But she does. She wants to lose her ability to feel. You know, I read somewhere that that line, um, replace my milk with gall, implies that she had just lost a child and you know i'm not sure that's not stretching things a little bit but it is interesting and it might explain why someone might pray a prayer like this to evil spirits yeah know. that's a common interpretation uh from this text there's a couple of things that people say indicate that she had just lost a baby even macbeth's behavior at the beginning of the play seems kind of crazy and suggests that you know, but back to the question that the Shakespeare company, when they were at my school, asked my students, they said, have you ever done something that violated your own conscience? And why do we do that? And pain is a reason a lot of times that we violate our own conscience. Love for a lover is another reason that we violate our own conscience. Ambition is another reason. You know, we don't have enough detail I don't think, maybe you could argue differently, but I don't think we can draw a full conclusion as to what really is motivating Lady Macbeth, maybe all three. Well, I think this is part of Shakespeare's genius. Um, you can't read this text without reading your own life experiences into the text. And that's what all great writers do, whether they're uh, writing songs or poetry or, or stories. I mean, we can all think back and look at times we violated our own conscience and see what motivated us to do it. I mean, I noticed that um, you're prone to take up Lady Macbeth's defense. <laughs> 
because you are a strong woman and identify with her in that way. I hope you're not a murderer, but you know, <laughs> no. I'm not saying that's a wrong way to approach it. I think it's it's right. It's what we do. You said many times that great art is the collaboration between a reader and a writer, and he leaves her motivation open ended. And when I uh, think about this, I look at it from the male perspective. If I were Macbeth. I would certainly want your support if I was thinking about doing something like this. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, Macbeth walks in as she's finishing this horrible prayer, and she says this, Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future and the instant. You know, for whatever reason, for love of him, for love of her own ambition, for wanting to get rid of the present— Whatever it is uh, that she wants to do, she wants it as much as he does, for whatever reason. His response to her when she says that is, my dearest love. I mean, that's nice. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. There's shorthand in that phrase. We all understand what he means by that. These two are on the same page. And listen to her response. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time, bear welcome in our eye, your hand, your tongue, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Wow, I mean, she can read him like a book. Uh, the metaphor, be a serpent, is an interesting choice, of course. And we know that often uh, serpents are used to represent deceit. And that certainly applies here. But historically, serpents are also symbols of renewal. I mean, they shed their skin. They represent a life force. Well, by the end of this Act 1, Macbeth is committed to murder. <laughs> But not without one more exchange with Lady Macbeth. I mean, Christy, I'm not sure that this one makes Lady Macbeth look very good. And <laughs> no. I don't see any other way to describe this speech if not manipulative. I mean, um, however, uh, these two speeches may be some of the most psychologically interesting of the whole play. And, you know, if we look at Macbeth's speech, he says something I think we have all fantasized about when it comes to doing things we know to be wrong. Macbeth says uh, hopes it could be done quickly and that there would be no consequences for his actions. If it were done, when tis done, then twere well, it would be done quickly. If the assassination could tremble up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be all and end all here. But here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. You know, that's what everyone wants when they're doing something wrong. You know, it reminds me of the kid who eats the candy his mother has told him not to eat. You want to eat it as quickly as possible so mom can't see you. And certainly you don't want to get in trouble. You sound like you speak from experience. It's happened. Oh, well, anyway, <laughs> you know, every kid learns sooner or later uh, life doesn't work that way. And no one ever gets away with anything ever. I mean, the universe will just not cooperate. And there is always, always, always a consequence to everything. And, you know, and consequences are unpredictable. And there's no circumstance on uh, planet Earth where actions have no consequences. And, you know, Macbeth seems to even acknowledge this. Uh, that last line, but here upon this band and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. I mean, that line uh, didn't make sense to me. So I looked at the modern translation of it. And the modern translation reads this way. I'd gladly do the deed and put my soul at risk for the rewards I'd get. You know, in other words, I know I might go to hell, but it's worth it. Ooh, well, the consequences never feel as bad on the front end than they do on the back end. And Macbeth's speech, if we were going to keep reading it, is a list of a series of logical reasons that he shouldn't kill the king. And they're good reasons. First, Duncan and he are friends. They're cousins. I mean, he says that's good enough reason just there. But then there's the fact that Duncan is staying in his home and he's an honorable person and you're supposed to take care of the people and your responsibility. I mean, that's true today, but it was certainly a bigger deal back then. He calls that a double trust. 
But those aren't the only reasons not to kill Duncan. Duncan's a good leader. He's a good person. In fact, he's such a good person. People will call him an angel when he passes, and there will be a trumpet blast from heaven declaring the horror of someone killing a person as good as Duncan. Well, I'd say those are pretty good reasons, and they would deter me. Well, they are. And by the end of the soliloquy, you know, he is deterred. He's talked himself out of it. Uh, but not that. And he tells Lady Macbeth that. He's going to say, we're calling this whole thing off. He says, we will proceed no further in this business. He has honored me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn out in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. In other words, I've really done some good stuff here, and I've got a lot of respect around here. If I kill Duncan, that's going away. He knows he can't have it all. If he kills Duncan, he loses his reputation and all of the relationships that he's created up to this point in his life. Exactly, which is why Lady Macbeth's speech to him uh, here seems actually wicked. I mean, she literally gaslights him. In other words, um, she lies about what he told her. She starts, was the hope drunk where you dressed yourself? She says things like, uh, this is what you said you wanted. I, I'm not sure that it's exactly what he said to her in that letter. I mean, she rec- she creates an either-or situation, which I know you know is a logical <laughs> fallacy. And she says, either you kill him or you live like a coward. You know, that's just not a true statement. Um, she challenges his manhood. She says, when you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you'd be so much more than the man. You know, in other words, you're not a man if you back down. And again, this is just simply an untrue statement. I mean, but the biggest kick in the gut is her final accusation. And I know it's famous, but it's worth reading for those who may not have read it in a while. I have given suck and you know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out. Had I so sworn as you have done to this? (laughs) Wow. In other words, I would have taken the breast out of my baby's mouth and dashed out his brains (laughs) if I had promised to do it. So I have more nerve than you do. And there's absolutely no logic in these statements. And it's all emotional arguments. And she's not even been put to the test on this idea. No. And if you buy into the theory that Lady Macbeth recently had a miscarriage, you know, that would mean that her breasts still contain milk and and that last line would be even too much for any mother for certainly any father she dashed the brains out of their child oh should are we making an argument here for postpartum depression (laughs) maybe so (laughs) well you know his response is logical you know he says what happens if we should fail i mean she dismisses it she says this we fail Screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. You know, then she gives him her plan. She's going to get the guards drunk. They can do whatever they like to Duncan and then blame the guards. That's not a great plan, is it? No, you know, these plans never are. (laughs) Act two, we see it all fall apart pretty much instantly. However, the one point I think we cannot dispute, and I know there's a lot to dispute about Lady Macbeth's speeches here, but that she and he are talking in the first person plural. They're one here. We fail. Will not fail. This is what we watch disintegrate with the murder. The one unexpected consequence. They will never again be one. Act two opens with another act of graciousness by King Duncan. Banquo and his son Fleance arrive at Macbeth's castle. It's pitch black. There are no stars but they bring a gift from Duncan. This diamond he greets your wife with all by the name of most kind hostess. So let me interrupt you for a second. Uh, Macbeth mentioned in his speech that he shouldn't kill Duncan because he was his host. But I want to underscore how important that is in ancient cultures. I mean, um, if you're familiar with the Odyssey or even Beowulf, you saw this. It's a sacred, literally a sacred duty. I mean, in Greek mythology, um, Zeus condemned people for eternity for mistreating their guests. And so, you know, we see in the book of Genesis in the biblical text, hospitality is sacred. And right before Macbeth kills Duncan, 
he's reminded not just by this gift, uh, but by the fact that it is in reciprocation for his hospitality. I mean, hospitality that he is prepared to betray. Before dismissing Banquo, he and Banquo once again talk about the weird sisters. Banquo brings it up. Macbeth kind of asks him if he's loyal to him. Banquo replies, sure, but first to the king. I mean, after Banquo leaves, Macbeth has one more soliloquy. It's a strange speech. It's a vision. He sees a dagger in front of him. The handle of the dagger points to his hand. In the vision, the dagger leads him, in his words, the way that I was going. He refers to Hecate, the goddess of the underworld, the queen of the witches, He references a man named Tarquin. That's the guy famous for raping Lucretia, who ended up committing suicide. A bell rings, and these are his final words. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. It's important that the murder is committed off stage. We don't see it. You know, that matters because if we're going to empathize with Macbeth at all, I'm not sure that would even be possible if we watched him brutally, you know, kill a man, an innocent man. And this murder is brutal. He uses two daggers uh, and he forgets to leave the leave them at the dead body like he was planning on doing. So you can imagine, you know, what that must have looked like. So, you know, it's funny how typical this is of human nature. I mean, how many times when we violate our own sense of right and uh, when do we immediately, and I mean immediately, regret it? And I would say it's almost 100%, and this is what happens to Macbeth. And, you know, he not only regrets it, but he realizes there will be psychological and physical consequences. And I would like to point out, this is what he wanted, but he was willing to, to give responsibility for it to witches and interpretations of signs. In other words, he was passing off the credit to things outside of himself. Well, his speech here to Lady Macbeth is, again, some very famous lines. First, there's the discussion of sleep. Sleep, of course, represents peace, and Macbeth understands he will never have a moment's peace again for the rest of his life. Methought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep, the innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second choice, chief nourisher in life's feast. It's a little nerdy to point this out, but Shakespeare does a lot in this play with meter that supports what he's trying to say in the play. You know, I talked about this with the witches, that he reversed, you know, the pattern of speech that they that they do here. He plays again with it right here. Right here after this murder, Macbeth's meter breaks. He's always been talking in iambic pentameter, and he still does. But um, but um, but um. But it's fragmented. It's broken. He's broken. I mean, Lady Macbeth tries to help him. Why, worthy Thane, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain-sickly of things. Go get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. You know, we'll see again the image uh, at the end of the play. This idea of washing the blood off your hands. She tells him to go and wash the filthy witness from your hands. She tells him to go, well, just give her the daggers. She's going to end up putting them by the bodies. She says this, The sleeping and the dead are just as pictures to the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. In other words, you know, dead people don't look any different from sleeping people. It's childish to be scared of a dead body. She goes on to say this, and this is famous too. A little water clears us of this deed. Except Macbeth knows that's just not true. He says this, To know my deed, t'were best not know myself. Wake, Duncan, with thy knocking, I would thou couldst. 
You know, I've read that one of the reasons uh, Macbeth is so popular is that it can be interpreted in so many different ways. And the um, emotional aspect of our understanding uh, for whatever it is Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are, are doing here is v- really very complicated. I mean, there's enough narrative distance between us and Duncan to not feel sad that he's killed. And, um, you know, and after all, this is a brutal world. And although it's a Christian world, it's an emerging Christian world. And these pagan values of settling matters of right and wrong really doesn't seem that immoral. Exactly. And Shakespeare is not going to just let us categorically write off that Macbeth is a bad person. We're walking through these events with him and with Lady Macbeth, and we can share their feelings. Aristotle, in his book Poetics, defines tragedy as having moral ambiguity. A tragic hero is not one who is necessarily flawed, but one who makes a great error. I want to quote Aristotle. This is the sort of man who is not conspicuous for virtue and justice and whose fall into misery is not due to vice and depravity, but rather to some error. A man who enjoys prosperity and a high reputation like Oedipus or Thestes and other famous members of families like theirs. The change in fortune will be not from misery to prosperity, but the reverse, from prosperity to misery. And it will be due... Not to depravity, but to some great error, either in such a man as I have described or in one better than this, but no worse. So you uh, you think Macbeth is just about making a bad decision, not an evil one? Maybe. I'll also argue that killing Duncan isn't the climax of the play and isn't the biggest mistake. <laughs> oh, it could be makes. worse. You know, after Macbeth kills Duncan, um, a new character is introduced, a thane by the name of Macduff, right after uh, Macbeth's killed Duncan. Uh, Macduff is one who discovers the body. And after Macduff discovers the body, Macbeth runs out and immediately kills the guards who he has blamed for the murder. You know, this, of course, annoys Macduff since now the only witnesses cannot be interviewed. And Duncan's sons immediately flee the country, running for their lives, one to Ireland and the other to England. And Macbeth um, uses their absence to blame them for the murder. And because of this, he gets what he wants. And by the end of Act 2, Scene 4, Macbeth is now King of Scotland. But Macbeth will never be at rest. He will never be at peace. And that's where we find pity and fear, to use the Greek terms, uh, for Macbeth. It's where we find our own catharsis. If Macbeth is a psychological study of how a person descends into this fragmented chaos uh, of disintegration, we see perhaps that maybe it's not just one mistake, one thing that does it. It is one mistake that leads us to another mistake that leads us to another mistake And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a place we didn't see. And what we thought we so desperately wanted, what we were willing to sacrifice everything to get, it's not what we thought it was. And it's at that point that we will see Macbeth make a decision from which he cannot return. This is the essence of Macbeth. And in the next episode, we will discuss that very point of no return, the climax in Act 3. If Act 2 is about the fatal mistake of a noble man, Act 3 is about the making of a tyrant, you know, the creation of an evil one. So thanks for listening uh, and being with us today. And uh, don't forget, you can always find us at howtolovelitpodcast.com. You know, on our website, we have listening guides for most of our episodes, as well as teaching resources. Um, Also, whether you're a teacher or a student or a fellow lover of literature, please subscribe to our podcast via YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a rating uh, if you like what you hear, and possibly a review. Uh, Because it's when you share about the podcast to your friends on social media, that's how we grow. Thank you for supporting us in our mission to make reading great literature accessible and enjoyable to as many people as possible. Peace out.